leads in today's mastermind, uh, Clear Tai Chi Mastermind meeting. And with us today is Matt Holker, who is the regional organizer for Maryville, Tennessee, here in Knoxville Hi, everybody. area. And Greg Nolmeyer, who is in Ypsilanti and Michigan. And you tell them the other places. Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, Michigan, yeah. Hi. And Art Don, who is in the Washington, D.C. area. Hi, I'm in uh, Greenbelt, just east of Washington, D.C. <clears throat> Chris Walsh, who is in Maine. I'm going to let him tell you the local places. Hello, everyone. I'm in uh, Hollowell, Maine, just outside of Augusta. Harry uh, Legg, who's in Verona, New Jersey, outside of New York City. Yep, thank you. Hello, hello. Sheila Bell, who's in Costa Rica. I'll let her tell you which parts. Hi, everyone. Yes, I'm in the northern Pacific area called Guanacaste, very close to the Laveria Airport. Phil, um, Phil, Chan. Phil Chan, who is in uh, Columbus, Georgia. Say hi. Oh. Yeah. Hey. And John Kelly, who is in Boca Raton, Florida. Hot as heck, Boca Raton. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> You have the four seasons of Florida, early summer, mid-summer, late summer, and next summer. And I wish summer was over. <laughs> okay, um, so a quick word from our sponsor. Um, a lot of what we're getting ready to talk about here is directly regarding the history and the development of Clear Tai Chi. And if you want to know more about that in terms of actual curriculum and that kind of thing, go to clearmartialarts.com. And on there, you'll find... Oh, you'll find just a treasure trove of information about uh, not just uh, clear Tai Chi, but the internal principles of really all Tai Chi. Um, there's the, the Practical Guide to Internal Power is available there. Um, and other information about some of the other internal arts that we practice, Qigong methods. And uh, you know, just all this, all the stuff that we do, um, it's all, it's all right there at clearmartialarts.com. In our Tai Chi curriculum, so, so you can take, take it from the ground up, starting with the eight move set. Uh, if you've already got and been doing Tai Chi for a long time, then there's more advanced information on there too, like you was, some of what he was alluding to, and then even more. All right, so please avail yourself of that and help support your sponsor. Okay, so what we're going to talk about here is clear Tai Chi twin. C-H-U-A-N, a lot of people in America call, pronounce it Chuan, but every Chinese I've ever dealt with is, says Chuan, um, history. Uh, please realize that the real art of Tai Chi is Tai Chi Chuan, right? And I have two Tai Chi Chuan lineages that I have been with long term. Um, and the first one is Tyrone Jackson was my teacher. He was the number one disciple under Dr. Fred Wu who was a disciple under Liang Ong, who was a disciple of the Yang family taught primarily by Dong family. The, and I'm not sure if that was um, Dong Wuling or Dong Wuling's father, Dong Yu Jay, whose name I don't pronounce very well, please forgive me. And then um, the other one is I studied with Uncle Bill, I've been with him since 1994, so like 19, yeah, 1993, 1994, 26, 27 years. He studied directly with Dong Ling, um, first his family growing up, and then Dong Ling, who obviously studied from his father, Dong Ying Jae, and Yong family, and then the Yong family. So it is similar, or, or it gets back to the same place in that sense of who I've been with longer. And there is obviously a heavy Yong influence there, and Dong family influence there, um, and all of that. And Dong family were the fighters for the Yongs. If somebody came and challenged the Yongs to fight, Normally, uh, once the Dong family was, was really there and studying, they were the ones that took those fights. And so they really had the martial side of it really heavily and how to use it in the iron body, internal iron body and the internal iron palm and the demok and the whole thing. All right. In both of these lineages under Tyrone and Uncle Bill and, and doc, with doc, through Dr. Wu with Tyrone and then Uncle Bill, um, I am a recognized master in both systems. Um, I am by them. I am an indoor student, and we'll talk about what that means. And then I'm also, in each case, a lineage inheritor. And if there's questions about that, then I'll talk about what that means. An indoor student means you're getting the real stuff. There's what they call the public version, what they're kind of teaching out there for everybody, and that's always 
either low level or in some cases taught wrong, incorrect. Um, the, uh, and so when you're getting the real stuff, it's without any dilution and you're not waiting for years and years and years to get one, one item or one tidbit or one tidbit a year. It's they're really, really teaching you. Now there still are different levels of being an indoor student. Um, being the number one indoor disciple helps you get a much better inside track on that. The, uh, and you don't have to wait for the years and hope that eventually they'll really teach you something when you're an indoor student, you're really getting it. It's just how much and what level. And a lot of that depends on you and the teacher and the relationship and, and how long and where, where you're considered in terms, of, in terms of doing it. So for example, you could be an indoor student and not really be considered a lineage inheritor that maybe you're not even gonna teach. If you're going to be the lineage, a lineage inheritor or one of the senior lineage inheritors or the lineage inheritor, it all it becomes very important to that teacher to really pass the information to you because when they're dead and gone, you're the next generation. You're what represents them in the you know in history going forward. <coughs> Excuse me, while well, I take a small drink here. And so um, with that being recognized as a master and indoor student and the lineage inheritor uh, means some things in terms of the quality of information, how much information, um, and what, you know, just ability and knowledge and what you're able to do and the responsibilities, which I'll get into. In most Chinese styles of martial arts, if you are not an indoor student, you, then you will never really get the good stuff and you can't really teach it or what you're teaching is this very public version and that's all you know and unfortunately there's a lot of people who teach the public version and they think they're teaching the real art because they were never shown the other stuff and it's very common and the chinese teachers and or the teachers who learn directly with the chinese seem to be okay that it's that way um, they really just want the people that they really wanted to have it have it and everything else is about them getting paid this month and um, you know, and then keeping enough of a of a public communication that people know there's the art. Now, in the Western culture, there's a lot of people they don't realize this culture of hiding the information and in indoor students. But in Chinese culture, you understand the the average person in the martial arts there understands that is the culture. And when they go in there, if they're not really serious and they just want an activity to do, they're okay being a public student. If they're serious and they want the real stuff, whether it be for themselves or they plan to teach or whatever, they will work the extra hard to get and become an indoor student. And a lot of times they'll do it where they're being introduced to somebody, they're using every kind of family connection they've got. Think about it as getting in the best university you can get into and that it's very expensive and it's very um, demanding and it's very um, elite and very, and all that stuff and everything that would go into trying to get that and all the recommendations and all of the oh this is a great person and you should really teach this person and those kind of things and then whatever's going on behind the scenes where they're really like okay i'm going to really teach them or or you know pleading for that those kind of things all of that is normally going on in that culture and they're very keenly aware of it there are some pretty funny stories that come out of it actually being an indoor student also means that you have response, like in this case, I've got very specific responsibilities to those lineages that I, that I make it a very, that I'm very, uh, uh, that I'm very obligated to keep and that I feel very obligated to keep and that kind of a thing. And that's both to the style and to the teacher and or the family of my teachers. And if you're an indoor student, this is just an understood part of what that means. It's, it's you don't become, <clears throat> in most styles, there are ones that are different. Like ours is quite a bit more open. Most of them are closed enough that you know that that's just a serious part of the deal coming in. And if you don't meet that responsibility in the longer term, and other people that are sort of indoor, even if they're with another teacher who's just friendly to your stuff, like your system, um, Senior teachers tend to know each other. And if you get two senior teachers, senior teachers got some students, this other senior teacher's got some students, and you're not keeping the responsibilities, you'll find that eventually somebody who's in that other lineage is gonna be like, 
what are you doing? You know, what did you, you know, you turn your back on your family, you, you know, you, whatever. And the, and the, and there, there is stuff there. And I'm telling you that I've dealt with a good bit of that over the years. And when I say I've dealt with a good bit of that, like because of what I've done to formulate and have clear Tai Chi, you know, there are people who question that. And then I've been able to answer that for them. And in some cases felt very obligated to do it. In other cases, like it's none of your business, but I don't normally for this particular thing say that I actually normally will explain this is what the deal is and then they'll be like okay you're really keeping your commitments and the answer is absolutely I'm I'm 100% about that um <clears throat> trying to see think if there was anything else I needed to tell you with that was there something you were going to say about well, that well so I think kind of the question becomes and and really what basically the topic of the conversation is today is with that strong a lineage um, and you know and that and really the kind of that direct lineage really from two places kind of converging in historically to more or less towards the same point why is it that we refer to this as clear Tai Chi and, and I mean obviously I know the answer to that and I know where, where it's going but uh, and it's because those aren't you know those are not the only lineages involved yeah well it's because it's because it's two lineages as opposed to one and the uh, okay, and the uh, and so it's the two lineages, and then the other one is that um, I've got other influences besides that. The other one is is that um, most of the stuff that came from both teachers is very high level internal, and when you see the public version of what we do, it is still indoor material. But it's in my indoor material that are basically essential basics taught correctly with understandings from both lineages that I'm responsible to. And then when you when you get outside of that basic stuff, which happens very quickly, six months, year most, then you're and then everything else from there for our curriculum is the indoor secret stuff, the uh the normally for most styles being taught very directly. And it's stuff that comes from both of those teachers, plus the other teachers, and with, um, with certainly in Uncle Bill's case, who I still study from, um, direct permission from him and acknowledgement that this is good stuff, and yes, teach that. And the, the original of calling it Clear Tai Chi actually came from him, where the other seniors under Uncle Bill, Bellum de Toires, um, were very much about you had better be, 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 you know, keeping your commitment to the lineage and to, to Uncle Bill and the lineage. And it was like absolutely doing that. At the same time, you better not call what you're doing Uncle Bill stuff. And it was like, well, how am I supposed to do that? And I talked to Uncle about it. And Uncle, for Uncle, it was call it clear Tai Chi. And I am, and he is endorsing that. And so that's, hence that came about. At the same time, you know, he is my teacher like that and has been for, you know, over 25 years now acknowledge that way he acknowledges it that way and all that stuff so all that all right um i do have many years like from the time i started the martial arts and i'll talk briefly about that up until now of other martial arts training the one that i've done the longest and the most has been tai chi at this point but i have um i'm known i'm through uncle bill i'm a master level in kung tao silat um, I'm a teacher level at about four other martial arts and, and a full like Sifu or full instructor, that kind of thing. Um, but this talk is only going to be about my Tai Chi uh, twin studies, including the teachers and the styles and the methods and training influences and that kind of stuff. All right, so I've got to hear the word from our sponsor and it is please go check out clearmartialarts.com and um, take a look at our curriculum as we have it laid out there and the free practical guide to internal power and sign up for that and you'll see there's good information on there and um, avail yourself of our Tai Chi if you want a short form to work like eight moves and then you're really able to work on your different energies and skill sets and, and things with a lot lesser moves so that you can do it in several minutes a day and be working that um, we have that there and then of course there's the whole longer curriculum and the methods and all of that. So, all right. Um, I began my martial arts studies in 1975. I started with boxing. 
Um, I was basically 11 years old at the time. Um, I, had, I lived in bad inner city neighborhoods and I needed to be able to protect myself. That's why I started um, and around the age of 10. You know, I, I normally say 12, but I was in the second grade when this happened. And when I was in the second grade, I was 10 years old. The, uh, and so around the age of 10, I got attacked by two teenagers who were 18, 19, 20, somewhere up in there. And one of them had a knife and they pulled the knife on me and robbed me at knife point. Um, and I, and basically were threatening to stab me. And I realized at that point that if I didn't learn something about defending myself, I was going to end up stabbed in the street, uh, or worse. Um, anyways, and so I began getting other martial arts training around 1977, I actually got Taekwondo and then added basically powerful kicks to my punching. And so then had hands and feet going on at that point. And I still stuck more to the boxing stuff than the Taekwondo stuff for what I did with the punches. And I learned the way that they punch and all that. And I just realized the boxing typically was stronger. And so then had hands and feet, right? In 1979, I began to study Qigong, saw some stuff on TV, um, like where it was on the news, where they were showing some fairly impressive straight out of China Qigong stuff going on. And it was because Nixon had gone over and opened up those gates with China and the news media was, was every so often putting something on the news. And it was a guy working on somebody without touching them and another guy setting a guy's broken arm by hand um, and then using energy to do stuff with that. And I was like, wow, because the guy moving the guy, the other guy was, anyways, it was interesting. It got me very interested. And I started also doing meditation um, for mental discipline training um, and one of my teachers, you know, got me started on that path and it kind of went from there. Uh, and the next year, uh, somewhere right around 1980, 81, I started studying Kung Fu, uh, and did that with one of the disciples under Dr. Wu, not Tyrone yet, although I met Tyrone around that time out in the park. And, and then after meeting him, didn't think to ask him how to contact him when I was there. And then like the next day went, man, I'd like to get a hold of that guy. And didn't have any way to contact him and then went and got with Kenyatta the uh, and then studied with him for about two years and then ended up studying when I went to college ended up studying with Tyrone uh, in 1983 and ended up studying with Tyrone then the uh, when I was 16 my mom pointed out that I had inherited the family and I was doing the Kung Fu first and when I was 16, my mom pointed at my hands, and if you, if you can see my hands, what you'll see is that my fingers all have these, like that little finger there, you can see it the most in the thing right there, but even my index, they all look like they've been broken. And I've had two breaks on one hand, one of them, and my fingers are all like this. And the rest of my fingers have not been broken or even anything close to that. The, uh, and... The reason they look broken like that is it's an inherited form of arthritis. And my mom, when I was 16, 15, 16, one day looks at my hands and says, oh, I see you've got the inherited family arthritis. Your dad and I both have that. And I was like, okay. And she was like, do they hurt yet? I was like, no. Um, and then, you know, from there, she uh, said, well, and she's, she had me when she, I was born when she was 16. And so she's only 16 years older than me is what I'm saying. And she said that her fingers had hurt her for more than 10 years, which means I was coming up on getting what she had got. And so I had heard about Tai Chi being good for arthritis. I knew my teachers taught Tai Chi. And so I went back and started studying Tai Chi when I was 16. That's what got me started. The, uh, and I began to study for so Tai Chi for my first Kung Fu teacher because I heard that it was really good for arthritis. I told you that. I got further interested in the health part of Tai Chi at the age of 17 when I went to the funeral for one of my grandparents. Six months later, the next grandparent, all my grandparents were gone. I realized or talked to my mom and found out that two of the grandparents, her, her parents, both died before the age of 50. And that the others, the others died in their 50s and they didn't see 60 years old. I'm 56 now. The, uh, and I wanted to live a healthier and longer life than any of them had lived. Um, and so um, started really applying myself to the Tai Chi in that way. 
and, and how does this thing affect your life and make it so that you have a longer life and a better life and all of that. About 1984, when I was 20 years old, I began studying seriously with Tyrone. By 1986, I was an indoor disciple, and I was his student for just over, directly, for over 10 years until he had a stroke due to a, a congenital heart condition that was a that he was born with. The uh, and so it was, he, he had it. It wasn't even what I'd call genetic. It was it was um, you know it was a lifelong thing from from birth on. Anyways, he and my first teacher were indoor students of Dr. Fred Wu, which I told you. Uh, Tyrone was the number one disciple under Dr. Wu. Dr. Wu learned directly and was a disciple of Li Yingong. Li was a prolific writer on Tai Chi, and he was known as a serious Bagua guy and a Demak guy. He was an acupuncturist. He was the head of the Hong Kong Chinese Medical Association as an acupuncturist and the head and president of the Hong Kong Kung Fu Association he studied Tai Chi uh, with the Dong family and the Yang family directly. Um, and, and basically, I guess the Dong family, whoever, whichever one of them it was, were responsible for him. But he got a lot of interaction with the Yang family directly and Yang Sin Fu and all of that. The, um, Lee wrote the book Iron Palm in 100 Days, and he talks about several different kinds of Iron Palm in that book including one that comes from Tai Chi. He didn't tell anything in the book about how to do that. And even the methods he's gotten there, he's left things out. But it is a good, it was a good exposure and he became fairly famous for his iron palm and for doing that. And then he was known for the Demak and those kind of things. Because again, he was an acupuncturist and so he knew the health side and the martial side. Um, and he wrote, I don't know, a good half dozen, eight, 10 books, several of them on Tai Chi. There's a few of his books that are not translated into English and they're in Chinese only. Um, and then he wrote a book with Pei Shi Rong, uh, who was the guy who was one of the people off of Wudong Mountain that was really a recognized senior master off of, from Wudong Mountain. And I got to meet him in China in, 19, in 1994, 95, and actually trained with him a bit with, with uh, Pei Shi Rong. Um, Lee died in a plane accident of some sort. The, uh, all right. Dr. Wu was a contemporary of Chen Man Ching, and they knew each other pretty well. Um, and the, uh, I have about 15 years of training total in Dr. Wu's Tai Chi Chuan system. The, uh, all right. Um, by the way, on that internal iron palm, if you're interested in that, um, you can go to our store page on cleartaichi.com and we have the internal iron palm video or package for sale. You could also go to internalpowerrevelation.com and there's some information there about that and where you can talk to us directly, fill out a form there to make a phone call and talk to us directly about um, the internal iron palm and some of the other internal steel wrapped in cotton skills and or other stuff. This particularly would be of interest to you if you've been in Tai Chi for a long time and want a better hookup on the uh, deeper internal skill, higher level, usually closed door secret Tai Chi twin skills, uh, then you'd want to do that. That's internal power revelation, R-E-B-E-L-A-T-I-O-N.com. All right, anything else to say about that? Um, no, not for I'll give you guys more chance to weigh in here shortly. I'm trying to get through to a certain point. And are there any questions about anything I've said so far? I do, I do have a question, uh, but I don't I don't want to cut you off. I know I know you, no, you're no, we're good. getting to a place here, but but I know so you've got this really you've got really these these kind of two really strong lineages, and yet you went outside that and in the Tai Chi world there's a there's a, um, a community that's very all about sort of the purity of their lineage and uh, and I kind of understand that at the same time I also understand why you would want to explore a bigger like realm of Tai Chi but you you know you mentioned early on that you had you felt this and still feel this this connection to those lineages and this uh, desire to really represent them in a certain way and to carry that forward in a certain way. And so I'm curious why uh, you decided to go uh, outside of those lineages with your training. Yep. So, okay. So a few things. One of them is, is that Dr. Wu and then Tyrone 
and, and, I, and I didn't even see this from, from Dr. Wu, I saw it from Tyrone. He had the long form for Yang style, Chin style, like they're 108 for both of these. The 108 for Wu style, the 108 for, uh, there's like two Wu styles and he had both. And then he had another one and he had the long form. He was a form collector, a serious form collector. And he had all the long forms for them. He could do them and understood the energies that they were supposed to be working with and understood application, multiple, like massive amounts of application for every move and the whole thing. He had them all. And so there was that. Um, and I was, and I, you started everybody with young and then depending on there, you might get exposure to one or the other or see some more like you did show me some chin stuff, um, a bit of it. I don't recall him showing me much to do with Wu, but possibly. And then the other thing is, is I got my first book somewhere there in the mid 1980s and read it since I was studying the style of Tai Chi from cover to cover and then like read it again. Um, and then started getting more books and that kind of a thing. And somewhere in there, I realized that there were differences in the styles of Tai Chi. And if you look at a Yang style and a Chen style form being done, especially if it's like a cannon fist versus a regular Yang form, they look different enough to be like, okay, there are different things going on here. If you see a Wu form, you'll see other things going on than, are, than in those other two forms. And I began to go, okay, these are all Tai Chi. They are related and yet they're different, what goes on and what other things should I be really focused on here that, you know, because I began to realize the volume of information that involves Tai Chi and I went, how do I even begin to, outside of doing the moves, because it was learn this move, learn this move, learn this move, right, the forms. And then principles being taught to me through, but it was like, how do I begin to take this, to understand this and get the whole picture and, and how this works and what's supposed to go on and what are the kinds of things you should know and what is the history and what is the, and all that stuff. So I began to research that and study that. And with that, I would read, of course, things that are like, we're not really quite doing that or there's something else going on there in some kind of a way. And sometimes I would go back, most often if it was a direct question, I'd go back to Tyrone, but then I might see somebody doing another version of Tai Chi or because of my adventure studies life um, ended up where I was interacting with other people and they would be doing something or a specialist in something I was reading in one of the books. And I'd be like, oh, you specialize in that. Tell me more about that. And that's kind of how I got started learning from other people. But then it kept expanding as I went, including and really taking the biggest jump when I went to China the first time there in like 1993, 94. Um, and so... Does that answer the question kind of? I think me. so, yeah. And the big, the other part of that being that I was an avid student and obviously I couldn't be in front of Tyrone 24 seven. I'm still an avid student today. And so that's part of all that. I think if you, you know, a lot of people, they go for a while and then they kind of get their fill and then they quit. And that happens to a lot of people in their first year. It happens to a good number of people in their first three years. And by the time, if you got a hundred students in, by the time you hit seven to 10 years, most of the time there's less than five of those people left. And then at 10 year mark, it's one or two typically out of that same hundred. And at 20 years, you know, it's, 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 you're lucky if you've got one of them left and all of that. And even then they're typically about their studies a little more, well, okay, yeah, I'll get something else. I've been doing this for 20 years for me. When I'm really learning and picking up new information, I'm as thrilled as I was the first time I saw like the coolest thing. And so here I am 40, almost 45 years in to the study and I'm still an avid student. Like when I so see something I hadn't seen before um, that is skillful or get a no, new hookup on the knowledge, I'm excited about it and, and all about it. And always, uh, if it's a choice, let me put it this way, Uncle Bill most years for most of the last 25 has had a family gathering. Not every year, but most of the years. And I go to that and there's a bunch of other, I teach there and a bunch of other teachers teach there and then I get time with Uncle. And if it's a choice between me going out on the floor and teaching or I can get something new from Uncle, I'm gonna get something new from Uncle, you know, from my, from my teacher. And I'm much more interested in, and I, and I like teaching and I enjoy teaching and I enjoy working with people and I enjoy seeing people get it. But if it's a choice between doing that and I get something new and, and at my level of skill and 
um, and all of that. I'm gonna I'm gonna get something new. That's you know that's that. Um, yeah, the, the other difference is when I teach at a place, usually unless there's a student that did got something exceptional, felt something exceptional or something interesting, really super interesting happened. When that teaching session's over or a week later, it's like, well, now I'm doing the next thing. When I learn something new, I'm still playing with that toy for the next month and three months and six months until I own it. And so it really is a different experience that way. Um, so anyways, uh, so from Tyrone, I got exposed to the real higher level fighting method of Tai Chi. And I know when I started teaching in 1985, I'd already been exposed to the method. So my best estimate is that I got exposed to that in 1984. And if it wasn't, it was 1985. The, uh, and, and just earlier in the year. Anyways, and we call it, we tend to refer to it as the ghost fighting method. It really is, most teachers are gonna to refer to it more as the formless fighting method or if they're elemental in their approach, they'll call it like the air method or the void method at times, but don't confuse that with like high level Wuji, although it would help you to get there from a physical standpoint. Um, it's the formless fighting method's probably the, the best way if you were talking to another person who is an adept in Tai, you know, been in Tai Chi a long term and has some fighting knowledge, that's probably how they have heard it before. And the way that started was that um, I was sparring with the Kung Fu and even though I was learning the Tai Chi for the health, um, the guy that I was sparring with that day in class um, basically tapped me three times and ended up behind me. And I didn't see or feel, and I didn't touch him. And I was doing tiger style where I was trying to like grab him to, to rip things. And it was like I'd been, like I fought with a ghost and I asked him if he could do it again. And he did it again. And I, and I was trying to get him more, and, and same thing, tap, 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 he's standing behind me. And I wanted to know what the style was, and the style was Tai he said Tai Chi, and I was like, yeah, right, no, what style is that? You know, I expected some kind of a bagua or something, and it was like, that's Tai Chi, and I was like, okay, I gotta have that. And I was in the middle of a tiger form that was like 88 moves, and I had like half of it, about 40, 40, 45 moves worth. And I went to my teacher and went, I, I can't learn that other thing anymore. I have got to know the fighting part of this. And so, uh, yeah, and so then went from casually doing a Tai Chi, like I don't want to have arthritis pain and I want to live longer, to I got, okay, now I'm doing it for all these health reasons and I know I'm learning how to fight with it and all of that. And for better or worse, Tyrone definitely hooked me up on a bunch of things, but when it came to the fighting method, it was mostly, well, okay, so spar and try to do the things you're doing in your Tai Chi when you're doing that. And I'm like, I don't have a clue how that's going to get me to him. This is first, you got to be like air. You know, you're going to have to be super soft and relaxed and do these things that like for a young style approach. And I did that for the first six months fighting and trying to spar with the other Kung Fu students. I got beat every time, didn't land anything. About six months in, I landed the first proper Tai Chi technique. And then it took me six months more to be able to do that consistently. And I was working on it probably three hours a week, every week. Now it was without a lot of guidance about how to get there for that particular thing. But I was focused in that way that like, oh man, I got to be able to do that. And so, and, and, and he would tell me, yes, no, that kind of thing. Quit posing was the number one thing he would tell me. If I held still, he was like, Tai Chi doesn't do that. Quit, quit holding a posture, quit posing. It's not, it doesn't do that. So anyways, what's that? I can just imagine your Kung Fu teacher yelling, quit posing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, and so I was learning at that time, Lee's modified Yang style, Tai Chi Chuen, 108 form, which actually has about 450 moves in it. And many of the moves in the form are pre-1948 Yang style Tai Chi, uh, twin moves. The uh, Tyrone would teach three to 15 applications per move, typically when you learned it initially. And then the Tai Chi twin fighting principles that were specific to that, if there was something specific to that. Uh, and normally there is on each move, something that pertains to it, which you, that stuff you'll find more in our uh, combat Tai Chi volumes one through 18. Um, and I've got uh, the individual moves that I've got in there, and it's about 16 of them 
and then it's got the principles like that and how they pertain for real use in the street and that kind of thing. But anyways, um, the 108 move form, I didn't put it here, but I'll tell you guys this. I taught it for the first, from 1985 until 1988. That was the only form I had and the one I taught. I realized at some point in, in doing that, that Tyrone only had two students who ever actually finished that form. And he taught that form a lot. I was one of the two students. Um, and it wasn't because of, of the indoor thing. Um, it was because most people quit before they ever got done because it took two or three years to learn the form. Um, and then I realized that I did not have, in 1988, I didn't have a single student that had ever completed the form. And then, um, and then in 88, I got a, a teaching job of a, like a summer program thing at Antioch University in Yellow Springs, Ohio. And they wanted me to teach a six week course, eight week course of Tai Chi. And I was like, well, I've got 108 moves and it takes several years. And so I went to the books that I had, I was developing my library and looked up and went, okay, since I've got all the movements of Yang style, cause they're all in the 108, what is the shortest form I could find? And at that time, the shortest form I could find was the 24, and I knew all the movements, and then I basically engineered it from the list in the book, from the moves, made the 24, and still ended up only teaching about eight of the moves, 10 of the moves, during the eight-week session, um, six-week, eight-week session at Antioch University, because um, that's all we had time for. And by the way, I had the conversation with the administrator and said, well, I'm obviously not going to teach all that. And they were like, it's six weeks or eight weeks, whatever it was, teach what you can. And that's what they're there to do. Okay. So, so did that. Um, and then realized obviously that if I wasn't going to have anybody finishing the form, what was the point of teaching that if nobody's ever going to finish? And I would practice it sometimes, but it takes a half an hour to 40 minutes at this pace. So it's slow, but it's not super slow to do the form. And it was like, so am I gonna, if I'm gonna do it twice in a day, do I have an hour to two hours a day just to do that part before I start training anything else? And it got to be, I could see if there was no, you know, in times before, before prior to modern times when there was no radio, no TV, no automation, and you worked on your farm or whatever, and maybe you put in six, eight, 10 hours, and then all the rest of the time was essentially you know, not, not clearly doing anything um, and or you lived in a monastery or that kind of thing where you might put in that kind of time doing that. But for me and for the whole art, I was like, you know, and if you were doing it for a living, you were putting in eight hours a day practice time on the average, six to eight. And I was like, I would love to do all that, but that's just not going to really be a very conducive situation to the modern society. And most people aren't going to finish it. And even if I'm doing the practice like that, most people are not going to be able to, or they won't. And so I started, that's part of where the first time that I started to really start to consider things need to be done a little differently if people are really going to get this. And so about 1988. From Tyrone, I also learned Wu Chi, including the internal connections, the way that, I, that you guys see me teach it. The Tai Chi principles for health and healing, because obviously I started with that and was very intensely interested the basic push hands methods and how to use them and not the internal one that we do now, but the other kinds of push hands that you normally see in the very fixed push hands and that kind of thing. Um, the specific methods of, of how to use Tai Chi for arthritis and Tyrone specifically taught that. Uh, the Tai Chi cultivation flow, and, and by the way, and I was asking for it because of the reason I started. The Tai Chi Chi cultivation flow and Chi manipulation and storage methods and Tyrone was very much all about that um, for his own health stuff. The bone marrow washing and the Nigong um, and the other Nigong training that's more advanced in our system that some of you guys that are here already have, but I have some of, but there's more. The steel wrapped in cotton and how the steel wrapped in cotton works. And the internal, that includes the internal iron palm, internal iron body. Uh, the initial Fajin, and the first one he showed me there was more, more of a chin method, but then he started showing me stuff about yang methods. Pung Jin, uh, electric Jin, that was like the first one that I learned. That one is one that you use for arthritis, by the way. 
um, is you run electric zing in a certain kind of way, and it's in our it's in our basic program. So if you want to, if you're like, oh man, I'm wanting some of that stuff, and specifically like that, go to clearmartialarts.com. That's where you'll see the, that's where you'll have access to that, and it's one of the very first things we do in there. And we're not calling electric jing. I'm talking about feel the energy ball, and then keep it on when you're doing your form and how to do that. Um, GNC Jing uh, I got from Tyrone, and that's silk really. Uh, wave energy and waving, and he liked that one quite a bit. I remember being tossed on my head with it more than once. Absorbing and projecting and how to do that, yeah. Uh, most of the time, if Tyrone was gonna teach me how energy really felt and application, he wouldn't point it out and like explain it. He would just be like, bring a punch. Okay, did you feel that? Oh, you didn't really take that in. No, you gotta understand, you gotta feel that in your body and make sure, okay. And I would feel it and it'd be like, okay, duplicate that. That was his most common, we call it direct transmission. A direct ass whooping, but you know, <laughs> he's the language switch. Anyways, uh, he taught whole body breathing and specialized breathing and relaxation methods, which you see in our stuff today. He taught E mind skills and was an E twin is one of the methods that Lee Ying Ong was known for and that got passed down through. And so that, and then there's a crossover in the mind skills and the way that Tai Chi goes about it because E skill is still E skill and there is that level in the Tai Chi, the Chi level, then the E level, then the Jing level. And if you want to know more about that, then you should see the Tai Chi roadmap.com. Yeah. Um, specific shin skills, and Tyrone really had some nice shin skill and was very, um, liked using it and he used it for some healing stuff specifically. And then he would use it uh, martially and taught some of that to the indoor students very carefully and, and with uh, careful consideration before he would show it. Um, and I actually remember the first time I got exposed to that, we were in the alley beside his house with the gravel and the, and the glass and the dirt and everything else. But anyways, and he also taught me, I told you guys this, some Chen style Tai Chi and some things about that. So, and I didn't care for that that much. And so I didn't like go deeper in it. I just kind of stuck to the young and doing more with that. Anyways, um, any questions about any of the training with Tyrone or any of the things I've talked to you guys about at the moment? And now, a word from our sponsor. For those of you who are interested in internal power and want a reliable place to start, and for anyone who wants to experience internal power for themselves, go to internalpowerguide.com. I built a crash course in hands-on internal power. The Practical Guide to Internal Power is a work at your own pace online program. It is the course I use to get students from zero to 60 as quickly as possible. And it is totally free. So sign up at internalpowerguide.com now and get started right away. That's internalpowerguide.com. In 1986, I met my Tibetan arts teacher who had a very high level Tai Chi and internal arts. And he taught me uh, he taught me a bunch of very, uh, very high level Tai Chi, including more E mind skill and Shin spiritual work. And he specialized more in the Shin aspect. Now you have to be careful when you're training Shin or if you're trying to jump to that, train incorrectly, it can make you crazy. And a lot of about, about one out, about half the teachers out there that are teaching that, they're Looney Tunes, they're nuts. And it can be nuts, it can be, mentally disturbed enough, for lack of a better way to say this, that they are dangerous to be around than this teacher was. I trained with him knowing that at any moment, he might kill me and that would be it. And I wouldn't do it today, but I was young and dumb and you know, you get the rest. The, uh, and he did teach me a, a good bit more breath training and about issuing and withdrawing force, internal power based applications like that integration of those things with whole body power in real time and he was the most powerful person I had ever put hands on with and by the way when you asked me about training with other people the way I started training with him was I met him at Wright State University and he uh, he knew I was teaching uh, Kung Fu this was about 1985-86 and started asking me about what I was doing and seemed very interested and I thought the dude was like 24 years old 25 
And he was very, like, seemed very stoked about what I was doing. And, hey, let's get together. I'd like to learn some of that and that stuff. And he lived in, in uh, Yellow Springs. And Yellow Springs being that had the university, there was a university, little bitty town. Um, and it's one of the top, like, 100 coolest places in North America, or it has been in the past. And there's some very interesting and neat things there. But anyways, and so if you were progressive and you're thinking like that, um, that kind of thing, this is one of the places for the Dayton, Ohio area, where you're likely to live. And so we connected a couple different times, maybe two, three, four, five at the university. And then he was inviting me to come out to his apartment. And, the, uh, and so finally one day, when I was teaching at Antioch, actually, uh, actually, but it had to have been before that because I taught there in 88. So anyways, at some, I went to Yellow Springs on occasion. And so at some point I went out there and I was like, hey, I'll go see this guy. And I go over to his house, his apartment. He opens the door, I go in, and from the beginning of the apartment after you get in the, after you get past the foyer, into the rest of the apartment, it's only training equipment. It was a springs hanging from the ceiling. It was blocks set up with blocks on them. It was other, other mechanisms for that. Uh, a, a bookcase that went down all the way down the wall with a library on it. And I was like, holy crap. And he had an iron skillet that was an old time iron skillet. And he was like, oh, hey. And he takes his hand and he slaps it across the skillet and then slaps back it like, blam, blam, and hits it again. And I realized that dudes like got monster power and I start like, okay. And I start talking to him and somewhere in this, I realized he is not 24 or 25. He's 45. And so at that point I became his student <laughs> about then. And I saw he did some things. So that, that was involved in that. And including at some point he said, he talked to me about Kung Fu something or other, and he said, oh, attack me with that. It was like monkey style where you jump and come down on somebody. And I was like, you really don't want me to attack you with that. Like, I'm big for a monkey stylist. My teacher is primary external style was monkey. And like, I can, even though it's not my build, I can do a bit of it. And if I jump, you know, you're talking about 100 and at that time, probably 160 pounds flying through the air. And it was like, jump now, do it. And so I was like, okay, wham, I jumped. He caught me out of the air, turned me, and set me down on his leg and said, now do you get it? And I was like, uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, okay. And, you know, and then it went from there. The, uh, anyways, the E skills and the shin, and somewhere, probably not at that moment, but soon after is when I realized he was not quite all there. Uh... And then, and then somewhere in the training, I realized he had done the Shen training in the way that you can do it that's going to make you kind of crazy like that and like that. And so anyways, um, I was only with him for a couple of years, and then I met a Buddhist monk. I went to from, from uh, Dayton to Tampa in 1988, 1989, right there. And then I met this Buddhist monk, Lucian. And he briefly taught me, and we had a friendship, a good friendship, for a better part of 10 years. As far as I could tell, he was not crazy, but he had these Shin skills and the, the higher level Buddhist monk skills in this way, and the Tai Chi. And from him is where I first saw the pillow body stuff and learned that, um, and a bunch of other higher level skills in that vein and other aspects that had to do with the internal higher body um, and that kind of thing. So can we just take a moment to confirm that the whole like crazy making Shen stuff is not part of clear Tai Chi as a whole? I have Shen training, a lot of it, but I have a pro an approach to it that I made sure to learn so that somebody doing it properly can learn it with, and keep their mind. And if you're going to have a disturbed mind because of it, it shows very early the way that I've got it in the program. And then it's like, okay, I'm sorry, you can't do that part. We can work on your mind and the E skills and see if we can get your mind strong enough. And if we can do that, then you can learn Shen. If your mind cannot be strong enough, do not learn this. I am not, I, I am not a fan of, do not want any part of, am not interested in, and will not teach somebody, period, if I find they're doing this, in making crazy people. Don't want no part of it. The, uh, and if that's what you're after, I, I feel for you. You really, you really need to get help and about why your psyche is wanting you to do something that's going to make you a nutcase 
and don't do it. Simple. All right. It's not worth it. To me, it's not worth it. All right. I should hope not. Yeah. Well, it's not worth it for me to do it myself, and I'm not going to teach somebody else to do it. I don't want to be responsible for the, for, the, for the aftermath of that and the ongoing of that. But so you did find ways to, to work that safely. In that, yes, that like the Buddhist monk, the one in Tampa, he really had it. Um, and he had it, and he was of that very sound mind and that kind of a thing. And then uncles really got it. And although uncles got some ways about him, and some people will think or say, oh, they're crazy. It's the ways he's got about him are much more about where he comes from culturally and then living in the United States. And there's a very different cultural thing going on there and he's managed to kind of merge both of them in the way that works for him um and then the other one is is that the old school masters are really very um tough physically and tough mentally individuals and they come across to the average modern day person as being fairly for lack of a better word harsh and I came up originally under almost every teacher I had was much more like this. And I prefer that. I try to be much more um, uh, socially and in, in, even from a leadership position, modern and, and more, um, what's the word I want to use? Uh, not affable exactly, but towards affable about things. But make no mistake, if you're one of my serious long-term indoor students, there's a line you, you tow, and you better tow it or get out. It's not, I'm not playing. And the reason why I'm like that's because I am responsible, in my mind at least, and in their mind too, I guarantee it, to them and the style. And if you're not coming from that place, you don't belong in this system. You can do a beginning stuff. You can do the stuff we've got online for you. But if you want the real stuff, the bigger price you're paying for that is that. If you're saying, hey, I don't want that, or I want to stop, but I don't want to do the other side. Don't make me throw you out. Well, and the, and the stuff that's available online is real. That's not. Oh, I mean, let's not say it's not real. No, it's, it's real. It's absolutely real stuff. Um, but uh, but yeah, to become a deeper part of the organization and to really represent Clear Tai Chi that way, if you're not, I mean, if you're not representing it, you're not representing. Well, and the long story short, traditionally the teachers would only teach people under two circumstances, and the first one is you're indoor, you're really you're really part of the family, and you're doing and have the responsibility of your part of the family. And it's not like today. Today, kids get 18, my son's done this, and off they run doing whatever with whoever, however, and it's like, screw you guys. But historically, that was not done very much. It was much more like, I'm part of this family, I'm the person carrying this family forward, and there are responsibilities to that. The, uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's kind of the deal. Anyways, the way that outsiders who really wanted to get it got it is they pay for it, and it's expensive compared to what somebody that's a family member is paying is normal. If they're paying something, it would either be labor or work but if you came from outside the family and you're really going to get it you know you'd spend some time somewhere between 10 and 50 times what somebody that's in the family would to get the stuff and then no you're not quite as beholden because um you know you paid for it the uh but for what i charge for prices think think 10 times and you start to get in the neighborhood of what it would cost if you weren't if you're one of the family members like this accepted indoor and you're not doing that anyways i'm not trying to jump all over you guys or anything like that i'm just trying to make sure you're you're clear because most of the time i come across in a way where you wouldn't know that that responsibility is there if you're one of our serious people but but it absolutely is the case i just like i said tend to be a lot calmer and nicer about the whole thing until you get to a certain point and then if you're messing up i gotta i gotta be the guy that's gonna help you get back in line um anyways um, well, there's a strong amount of quality control also in, in, in the material. In the material. And I'm trying to make sure that that's what it is and that you're really, if you're doing this seriously, you're doing this and not other things. It'd be different if I had some kind of hole in the curriculum and you're trying to fill that hole, but I've made a pretty dedicated effort in the 45 years of study that I've been at to have it not, to have it where there aren't holes in the system in that way. Anyways. Um, so you've heard us talk about some fairly advanced kinds of skills there, and I haven't gone into detail about it. Are there any questions about any of those things? And obviously uh, my answer may be muted a bit, but at the same time, I don't want there to be 
deep, dark mystery about it. So, so what kind of questions might you have? And, and can I try to share something, you know, shed some light on for you? No thoughts. Oh. Not really a question, but just uh, an appreciation for putting out there your complete, you know, mostly background and understanding the lineage. Um, uh, there uh, a place that I studied prior to this where it was a little bit of a mystery and you kind of wondered what it's really... Questionable lineage, yeah, yeah. lineage. So it's, it's good to, to know this. So thank you. Yeah. Well, and I knew that a part of it too is you get people who study our stuff because what I've got mostly is the indoor stuff, the real stuff and all of that. And we're putting that out there, like you said. And then obviously for those of you that continue to study, and I'm pretty accepting. Somebody's got to really be doing something coming from a really negative, bad place or doing negative, bad, you know, things that are messed up where it's like, okay, I don't want to teach this person in the way that most people for students in their school accept students. And so with that, pretty quickly, people can get skilled in our system in three years time in a way that most people can't get with 20 years time in other systems. And then what happens is, is that they tend to think, Oh, I've reached the Zenith. I've reached the peak. And I'm like, well, you've definitely got higher level skills than most other people walking around. But if you want to compare that to like to the 45 years I've been putting into this, you're maybe if you're lucky 10%, you know, out of what's really there to be had. And it's that the, the, the hot top end, the high level stuff, there's so much more of that than there is in all the beginning and all the intermediate curriculum put together, like everything up to the top 10% of high level stuff, that top 10% is multiple times more information and stuff than there is in the other 90%. And it's that the high end of the high end of the curriculum really has that but people aren't going to know that if they stop at year three, that, you know, that I can give them insight into it in year three and take them up to that master level. But then the master level stuff, there's like a massive amount of information and really high level next, next level stuff. And if they quit at the, the three year mark, because they can go out and teach now and everybody's like, man, that guy's a master. You know, they're never going to get the stuff that's really super cool. high level because they stopped. The, uh, so for most, most, I'm sorry, uh, most people have no idea how much yeah. there is. You well, don't know you, what you don't know. Yeah, and you've seen that with people looking at our beginning material and when people did it again last weekend in the Push Hands workshop where they were like, half the guys had been doing this for 10 plus years and they were like, oh my God, this is the most advanced stuff I've seen. And I really got across to them very clearly. This is level one in our curriculum. Yeah. And so, and I know you had that experience with the Tai Chi basic skills, what I call basic skills, but our level one curriculum, that's the one that you can buy right online at clearmartialarts.com and do it either by the month um, and then pay, you know, a monthly subscription rate or just buy that program outright. But I remember when you first took it, it was like, this is at 10 years into martial arts at that point, it was like, this was the most advanced Tai Chi I've, I've seen. This is, this is all advanced stuff. Anyways, right. go ahead. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I've said over and over in various of uh, these calls and elsewhere that uh, your basic level is kind of high level for, unfortunately, way too many. But for like the teachers that I studied with, for most of them, they'd be like, okay, yeah, that's an excellent beginning curriculum. Yeah. And that's, that's, <laughs> yep. that's the difference. It becomes yeah. really evident, like where that's, where that's coming from and, and, you know, that that's built into the program. When you look at your background, like you're talking about, I mean, you were already a master level, a recognized master level by the time you met some of these other teachers. And then you by know, 1990, somewhere between, well, 93 is when officially I got that recognition from Tyrone, but he basically was kind of looking towards that. I'd actually accomplished it somewhere around 1990. Yeah. So, I mean, we're talking about 30 years now of dedicated study dedicated since, since, since having a first master level yeah. since becoming a master that's how big the curriculum is at the master level is he's still getting it <laughs> and so yeah oh yeah uncle I, I every time i see uncle i get some uh, you know i think okay i've reached the top point and he will teach me something else that's like holy mackerel the uh you know there's something else and it and it, it it's at another level of of just as advanced as you can imagine. Chris, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Was there something you were gonna weigh in on there or add? 
I, I wanted to ask, uh, could, could you speak a little more about um, why pre-1948 Tai Chi is meaningful? Yes, pre-19, in 1948, when the communists in China came to power, they really took a lot of the cultural things in China that were well known, and Tai Chi was one of those things. And they forced the master and the Kung Fu and the Tai Chi, they forced the masters to make what they then called government forms. And they did it basically at, and when I say at gunpoint, it's not like they held the gun to their head the whole time, but essentially the gun was held to their head. You're going to do this or we're going to kill you. And they made the Yang family and the Chen family and the Wu family make government forms that then are what got taught. So the 24 initially was the government form of the Yang family, the Yang 24 of the Yang family form. Well, so they simplified it all greatly. They tamed it down and then they actually, each of the masters for the most part, put very specific things into the government forms that are really, really wrong and that long-term will typically will hurt you. And they did it on purpose. And they did it because they were forced to do it basically at, under threat of death and didn't want to. And so then after that, the public versions of the form, because they had to hide the fact they were doing this, otherwise they would have still been in deep trouble, maybe getting killed. And so they hid the fact that they did it as best as they could. And so then the Tai Chi that happened before 1948 got taken very indoor and hidden. Most people didn't get to see it. And they did things that reflected better what they had done with the government version. Now for the Young family, it was mostly a simplification and a leaving off of a lot of energies, uh, like particularly root energy in certain kinds of way. And the way that you were connected to the ground is what I'm really, really saying with that. And some other things in that vein. For Chen style, they actually, if you look at a Chen stylist that's doing the government compulsory versions, they turn their knee in and then they put their body weight over it when they come back around and it's become the public version it's done and it is designed to completely destroy your knees you can't do that for 20 years and not end up needing knee surgery knee replacements this kind of thing and they did it on purpose the uh and so the pre-1948 tai chi because then the real tai chi was kept after that but even with that you know we're talking about 1948 so 70 70 some years ago and there's been where the, where the public stuff sort of creeps in to the real stuff just because there's so much of this mixture. It's one of the problems with teaching a public curriculum and teaching a, um, a, uh, an indoor secret curriculum is that you end up with bleed over what, even when you didn't intend or want it to happen. And so for me, once I realized that and I knew that I had the pre-1948 stuff, I really stuck to doing pre-1948 stuff. It's part of the reason why our Tai Chi for Yang style stuff that is that you can recognize as Yang style, and then you see us doing it versus somebody else doing Yang style form. There aren't like giant differences, but there are nuanced differences. The vast majority of the time, that difference is that what I had was pre-19, what I have is pre-1948, and what they're doing came out after those compulsory forms were made. And if you look at the 24 compulsory, the way most people are doing it, it looks like the government version. And so it is an important point that you're making there or asking about because it's, do you want the real stuff or not? And a lot of people would take offense to that. And I apologize and I'm sorry if you do, I'm not trying to offend. I'm trying to tell you what the real history of this thing is. Um, since you, you know, especially since you asked, um, like that. And then there's a lot of application stuff that when you start looking at some of the things that were really radically changed in the government forms versus the pre-1948 uh, and just sometimes in the posture or shape and a lot of times in the way that it moves um, and how it moves and why it's moving that way. Um, and it makes a big difference and it does on the health side too. Um, and I'm not, and I don't tend to look at it. A lot of people, if they were having this discussion, they're going to go by what my teacher told me and what I've been doing for 20 years. And it's basically because they feel this way about it or they were told something from the teacher they got it from. The other thing I've done that's about most of the stuff is I went to modern day uh, body mechanic stuff, physiology stuff, including like physical therapists and that kind of thing and said, 
what's the right posture? Would this harm your body in some way? What is the right kind of alignment here? What, you know, those kinds of things to look at it because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't just buying party line either. I want the one that works. And I am very, very, very focused on that. And fortunately, the vast majority of the indoor old stuff works really well. Every once in a while, you'll find one where there's a discrepancy of some kind. And then I try to justify, by justify, I mean an accounting justification, which means I'm trying to reconcile. okay, they're saying this, modern science looking at this real intelligently says this, is there a meeting ground here? Is it, no, this was just wrong or, oh, they don't understand what's going on over here yet. And I really try to evaluate it very scientifically, very analytically, because I want the thing that really works and it's gonna be good for you long-term and does the stuff. I don't want something that I just took as dogma and I'm following that and now I'm destroying my body in ways because I believe something that really I would have been better off not believing. Um, and so I've done that homework in the system. Um, and then most of the pre-1948 stuff, when you're talking about really moving with it and then how it's applied, um, it's, it's done the kind of things you guys that are on here have seen from me. And if you've looked at some of our video and you're seeing some stuff that looks, uh, you know, a little different, but very effective, ideally, um, then you're getting an idea for what that is. You sound like you have something to, to add to that or whatever. Or... Well, no, I just, I, I, um... I'm not sure that everybody uh, necessarily is taking away from this what I am taking away from it, but one of the things that I'll be, <clears throat> I'll be blunt, uh, when you encounter Tai Chi styles that, um, that you know, round eyes uh, or non-Asian non people have put together, um, a lot of times Ooh. it's a mixture of very low level stuff and it's, and it's kind of not, uh, you know, it's not good. Um, and, and so there's a tendency, uh, for us to, you know, uh, to, to talk about, well, this is a young derivative in this way and it's woo and it comes from all these Chinese sounding names. But I think the point to take away from this is that clear Tai Chi, the fact that we do clear Tai Chi is really something to be very proud of. Like we, we have a very strong lineage that's really deeply tied to very fundamental Tai Chi principles that go back to that, you know, that historical root, you know, before it got corrupted by the politics and the other, other things that have gone on in the world since then. Um, and that this really is very high level, very indoor uh, material that, it, that is the real stuff. And just because it is attached to uh, someone whose name doesn't sound Chinese, um, you know, it doesn't mean that it's I'm not. just trying to make it clear. Exactly. It's clear. It's clear Tai Chi. Um, and it really is. That's, that's uh, what I think is the kind of the funniest thing about it, honestly, is that this is the only Tai Chi at this level, at like the real level of like mind body skill that's beyond just form that I've ever actually understood. It is truly clear the way it's presented. Um, and you know, there's a reason for that. And I hope that what you're coming away with is a little bit more of an understanding of why that is. And that, you know, that this work has been done by Richard Clear so that all of us can you know can really benefit from that and that we can really easily learn these higher level skills that have been so hidden for so long and carry that forward and you know be good representatives of of this tradition when somebody puts together their own tai chi form if they don't understand physiology and anatomy really well and proper body mechanics then the form's going to have structural issues that are going to be a problem and ultimately it's going to be that people are going to come out of it with some kind of an, an injury or malady or problem that ideally wouldn't be happening. Um, and if they're fortunate enough to escape that problem, then we go to chi level and they really have to understand chi. And there's a lot of people in the West that chi doesn't exist and chi is energy. That's the simple translation. And so we can talk about what kind of chi, right? Is it, are we talking about way chi field stuff? Are we talking about chi at the meridian level that the acupuncturists work with? Are we talking about the yin chi, which is the nutritive level of chi in the body and how things get processed in and out both air and food and those kinds of things uh your bone marrow chi and the things that have to go that go to longevity and then other aspects of chi and do they understand that stuff when they're putting their form together if they don't i don't know how they're putting together a tai chi curriculum that they made up because they don't understand the fundamental thing for the tai chi to do what it really does and, and then and then on e level mind 
there's mind stuff and a lot of it, a large body of training and how that stuff is really used and how it's really used in your own body and then how it relates to your interaction with another person, both for healing and for martial. And if they don't have that E level of understanding, then how are they putting the form to get, you know, then what kind of system are we talking about here? And then obviously with the Jings and the Tai Chi Jings, there's 36 primary, rooting, waving, uh, Jan C. Jing silk reeling, um, spiraling, um, Tung, Fung Jing, um, Lu rollback, um, and, 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 you know, Fung Lu Jian and, and that set of things. And so if they're missing like Jing stuff again, I'm like, okay, you can call that your own whatever, but you can't call it Tai Chi anymore. It's missing too many things that are sort of a basic fundamental structure of how Tai Chi is. And so, and, and so I also started to find out with the histories that there's a lot of discrepancy or disagreement, better word to use, for, for the histories and where they come from. There are certain histories that are known and that are very specific, like how the Yang family got it from the Chen family is a pretty much agreed upon kind of a thing. Um, and then how the Wu family got it from the Yang family, and that's pretty much a known and agreed upon kind of thing and understood. But as soon as you get into Chen and Pat and, and start going into their history, things start to get muddy pretty quick. And then there's like when it got called Tai Chi, which started really in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And before that, what was it called? And there were actually about, I've found at least 12 styles that really inform and have to do with how Tai Chi came about and what those things really involve and how they, how they do and what they do. And you have to be able to take those things into account if you're going to really understand Tai Chi at a fundamental level for like doing more with it or codifying your own stuff. And if you're going to separate from it, you need to know how and why you're separating from it. And so it's not so much about is it Chin or is it Yang or is it Wu, but is it Tai Chi and what makes it Tai Chi? And our curriculum and our system does that. And I made it a pointed effort to study 45 years worth, or if you start me from 1979, 41 years worth to know that. Um, the, uh, anyways, hopefully you're getting some idea of what I'm talking about with this. And then if there's any other questions, we'll, I'll let you guys ask it. We'll talk it now. And then if that's it, then I'll do the word from our sponsor and that'll be it for today. And we'll pick it up next time. Sheila, I thought I saw her. Oh, Phil. Oh, Sifu, I had a question that's related to you know, your training through Tai Chi, it's not quite about the stuff you just talked about, but um, in terms of the hard method, yeah, is that something that, that you put together based on what you learned from other people? Is it something that someone taught you? Is it? Oh, I was taught it. I was, I was taught it. Was it by Uncle Bill or Tyrone or? No, uh, it was by another teacher who learned from uh, he studied for multiple teachers, and his original teacher was a guy like Uncle Bill, um, and then uh, you know another Dutch Indo that had a bunch of the Chinese systems. Part of what happened is that um, in, in the Indonesia and Malaysia are the spice islands for that whole part of China, and so um, whenever there's been political turmoil where people pick up and leave and like have to get out of the country, the most common place for them to go since the 1200s has been the Spice Islands below China. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that the largest immigrant population there are the Chinese. I know the money population as well, but um, but anyways, they're the largest immigrant population. And the Kung Fu and the Tai Chi and the internal arts, the Tai Chi twin, the arts that they have there, they couldn't keep the public stock because the, the art that is indigenous to the islands, sea lot and Penshock sea lot, and they tend to use blades of different sizes and shapes, and they're expertly skilled with those blades, and they're expertly skilled without those blades at fighting. They know how to kill people really fast. And if you were gonna survive in the culture and in the environment, you better have your A game. That's, and that's, and then you might still get you, but your A game, it better be the one you're bringing. Anything else, you're gonna die. And so what happened when the arts went there they've really been distilled down. And so like um, there are, whenever you find the Tai Chi twin or other Kung Fu that's there, it's at a very peak 
of its fighting, you won't find it there, and it's and it's not got the peak of the fighting aspect. Yeah. And so that teacher had that through one of the through one of the Tai Chi lineages. And I don't tend to. Sometimes you'll see I'm naming teachers and telling you people. Other times I'm not. If I'm not, then it's because there was some kind of a problem somewhere in there, either with the guy, like the one that that not mentally right, and so I don't want to name somebody for that, um, or other things like that. And so I won't name that person. Uh, and then sometimes it's that there was a problem between me and them directly. And it could be anything from, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of a simple example. I'll tell you what happened with this guy. This guy I went to China. He was ticked off that I went to China to train. And so he took one of my senior students that he'd been talking to unbeknownst to me. And I came back from China and this guy had business cards all over my area. <laughs> and I called the guy and was like, what the hell? And I didn't call the guy that had the business cards out because I knew that he, you know, I had writing on the wall that he might be like going to do that. But I called my teacher and said, hey, this guy's got business cards all over the place. And he said, oh, yeah, I've endorsed him. He's now the teacher there. And I said, well, I just quit your organization. And he said, no, you're out of my organization. And we, and then call went, and it went like this. And he said, never say my name again. And I said, you got it, yeah. <laughs> so I don't say his name. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you know, and then if I said his name now, most people never heard of him. But at the time, he was he was out there trying to making the rounds, and people did know who he was, but they didn't know who he was for me. <laughs> I on my training, and I got such a hookup in China that I didn't worry about it. But I actually got the fighting method from him, and he was very good at it. Very good at it, and the, and I knew where it came from, and I knew the, and the lineage there, and all of that, and that the method was well tested. And when you look at the Palchway, like I did go back, like I said, I, I kind of checked things. When you look at the Palchway and the Tai Chi, you look at how they're working. It's clear that it does come out of the method, just like what I was taught. You can see it, but um, but the Palchway's got a bit more sophistication. That is like the simple simplified version of that, designed for really fighting, fighting, fighting. You know, like if it's bad in the way I was talking about in Indonesia, that's a method that gets used and it works well. Okay. Did that help answer the question a bit? Yes, thank you. All right, I know I'm giving you long form answers. My biggest concern when I wrote this up to tell you guys is that I would feel like I was just skimming everything because I feel like I kind of am and that there would be like a lot of detail over, over, you know, just glossed over. And so when you're asking me a question, you're seeing that there really is substance there for every piece of it and i'm really wanting to be able to answer those questions and when this whenever this goes out and publicly people see it if they want to ask questions um, i'm really going to try to answer there are certain kinds of questions somebody would ask me where i'm going i'm not going to answer that like if they said hey could you tell me that guy's name no if i wanted to tell you the guy's name i told you the guy's name i'm not doing it but i'm telling you the name most of the time most of my teachers it's great relationship I love them. I feel that hopefully they love me. <laughs> I've been with them for years. We are like family and all the rest of that stuff. And so that issue wasn't there. But on a few times when there is an issue like that, um, then, you know, I'm going to try to be respectful of what is there while not glorifying it or, or you know, or doing something that goes against either something they have asked for or my own principles of, of just, you know, living life, for lack of a better way to say it. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, Sheila, did we jump Thank you. on something? Oh, you're welcome. Okay, so hopefully my internet will stay stable here for a minute. It's been kind of wonky, but um, like Harry, I just wanted to express um, my appreciation for the depth and width and long years of experience and um i was going to say you had put it through a sieve but when you said distilled i think that's that's probably the better term so um i really appreciate the efficiency for us or students of being able to see these things after you've already you know pulled out all the the weeds so to speak yeah there's a lot um, of also the <laughs> There's a lot of teachers that I went and met with and trained with where I would hear something about or I would read something and go, are they really doing that? And sometimes I would go and meet a teacher like that and they're really doing stuff and I was like, I'm here to study. 
And then I would go and look and it'd be like, and I'd be like, oh, okay, I'm not feeling anything from them. They're not doing anything that looks like anything. And when I actually get into the hard tack of it, it's that they don't have it. And then I've, and I've met many, many, many teachers that fall into both, both of these categories. And when I find it's that category, they really don't have it. I didn't waste my time. If I had information, like there are certain skills, like on the uh, on the marrow washing, I've got like half a dozen different methods for that. When you talk about um, uh, um, what's it called um, for Dimock, I've got like half a dozen different methods for that. When you talk about um, poison hand, I've got half a dozen different methods for that. And the one one or ones that I teach are the ones that I found were the safest for you, the most effective, the easiest. Not the easiest necessarily to learn, because sometimes the more powerful one is a little bit more difficult to learn. But where I really made choices, and, and in terms of like for the system, how did it fit, how did it gel with the rest of the system and the approach and that kind of thing, and it made my decisions based on that. Um, and so in a, a bit of that, there's things that I don't even talk about because I just didn't keep it for long enough or train with that teacher long enough for whatever reason, usually because they either didn't have it or there was something about the method where I went, ah, not that, that's not really gonna, that's either gonna be a problem in the longer term study or it's gonna be a problem of just doing that thing for however long or they really just didn't have it or didn't have the skill of it or it was like a one trick pony kind of thing, whatever it was. And so I was very careful in my teachers to, to sort of screen like that and then to stay with the ones that really had the juice and really had it going on and had it in depth and had it like that. But I have gone and paid people like lots of money to learn a specific skill that they were very, very good at. Um, and that was one that would be really nice to have, but that was pretty much, that was maybe their only real deal. Um, but that, uh, you know, but they were, but again, they were good enough at it. They didn't have to have a lot else for what they're up to. And for me, for the Tai Chi, I really want to be a real Tai Chi twin guy and not married to a style as much as married to, is this really Tai Chi? Sorry, go ahead. No, the other point that I was just going to say how useful I have found the 8 and the 13 to be in exactly the context that you're speaking of when you have, you know, a, like a semester or a bimester or whatever, however the institution is dividing up the time, it's it's just the best way to get that across in an efficient way and so where people are really getting benefits. So you know, I really appreciate those short words. semester, it's that you can do the eight and actually get into basic skills in a semester or set of classes and really cover the whole thing. And then they're going to know the eight, for, even if they forget some of the other extra methods and stuff, they will have done the eight so many times that they at least really have that as opposed to on move 96 or, or uh, 72 of the 108, they still have, you know, which is really 450 ish. And they, so let's say they're about 200 moves in, they still got 200 moves to go. And then they forget the whole thing. You know, it's, it's, there was really, it was doing them good for that little bit of time they had it, but it's not going to be long term great for them versus if they've got the eight and they can remember the eight and they practice the eight because they can do it in a fairly short period of time they're getting at least some benefit and then they if they want more they can study more and get more benefit because they're actually getting better understandings and then more movements and all the stuff cool. yeah like Thanks. especially my seniors what they want is like in a couple of weeks to feel like they can walk more with more stability obviously <laughs> You want to get to them as soon as possible with the with the benefits. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Harry. I can see you kind of molding something around over there. I uh, know, Sifu. I'm totally fine. I love everything that's uh, been talked about today. Really good stuff. Cool. All right. Anything else, anybody? Any other questions? Any other thoughts, comments? Oh. I just want to add that I, I especially enjoyed and appreciated your uh, more in-depth history. It uh, filled in some things and just gave me more insight into your uh, your learning and how you distilled that to to teach it. I think that it's excellent. Thank you. Cool. Well, I've taken you guys up through about 1986, 1988. And then we'll pick it up next time from there, and I'll, and I'll you know, and I'll, we'll ideally complete the other half up to the present day. 
kind of what I'm up to, and then um, like that. And so then I'm hoping that it gives you guys some better understandings of the system as a whole and that kind of thing too. And so that's part of what, that's really what our goal with this is, is so that, because a lot of people do have the questions about where does this come from and how is it like that? And how does he have, you know, if they've seen our stuff, they're like, how does this guy have that much stuff? Is he just making it up? You know, people will, you know, people want like, what is that? And how is he doing that? And what is it? And if they see the more advanced things we're doing for application, a lot of times it's like they have a hard time believing it. It's because the difference in the skill is I'm showing the skill of the years that I've been doing it for and if they've got 10 years worth of real training and they've been doing that for 25, you know, total time in now, 25 years or something, then they're still working with a 10 year knowledge base that they've had a little bit more time with, but they can't even relate to most of the stuff or the approach. And so it gets, it makes for some awkward moments. It makes for some interesting moments. And sometimes it's all good, but sometimes they're not so happy about it. it just depends on the person and the teacher and what the conversation or the interaction is. And I try to make it positive all the way around. I mean, it, it, most guys that have the kind of level that I've got, I'll be blunt, not everybody, but a large portion of them, they're jerks. And they can afford to be because they're top of the, they're top of the food chain, you know, and they know it. And I try not to do that. I want to be approachable. At the same time, I want to put my time into people that it's worth putting my time into. And I try not to fool around with people if I know that, they're, that, that I really shouldn't be pulling with that. If they're wanting it for just their own little get off the couch and do something, I try not to even be the person in front of them. And most of the time, you don't want me to be the person in front of them. They quit. If I'm teaching beginners that were just casually interested, they tend to quit. Um, we don't let them teach our beginners anymore. And all of that. Um, the uh, you know, but if they're open and they're and they're really interested and they're really serious about their studies and what they're doing. And they're not married to so their way is the only way, and or that and and you know they're respectful and can interact and all that stuff. We have some pretty good interaction. I do make the mistake sometimes if I will interact with somebody like they're coming from there and they're not coming from there, and then they bad mouth me later. That happens. Um, sometimes somebody will come in and because they're a known person with certain kinds of things going on, I'll feel them and I'll assume that they've got a little more skill than they've got, and then I get accused later of I manhandled them. I try to be very polite, very nice, very, as little as I can get away with initially, and then depending on how it goes from there. But it can be, mis it does get misunderstood a lot. People then assume I don't have skill, and it's like, no, make sure that you're, you know, if you're wondering, is that all you got? Ask me that, like that. And I'll be like, no, I've got a lot more with what, you know, let's, because I'm trying not to turn on everything. If I turn on everything, full on, um, it's going to turn into an injury, and right now, I mean, unless they've really, really got some serious skills and and or some good physical power to boot, it's going to injure them, not me. Um, and so I just try not to turn that on like that when I'm touching people most of the time, but unfortunately it gets misunderstood. What I've taken to doing in recent years and we'll do more of is I take those of you guys that are trained well and I'm going to put a hands on with you. And then from there, I gauge them, and then, okay, they're operating on, on a scale of zero to 100, they're operating at a 20, I'll give them a 24 or a 25. So then they'll feel like they're close to me. At the same time, people will come away from that going, well, he could beat me, but I felt like I was really close to his skill level. Well, I was operating at a 24, not 100. So yeah, we were really close in skill level that day. Because I wasn't trying to turn, I wasn't trying to do something to you. And so anyway, so it's, and so, and then I get people sometimes that early on in their training will be like, well, let me feel what you really got. And I'm kind of like, you know, uh, you're asking me to turn it up full blast and you don't know what that means. What I've done with people, if they want to do that, and I'm happy to do this, is I go, I'm going to turn this up by grades of about 10%, 10 to 20 most. And I will, so I'll operate at a 10. Okay, you got that. You want more? Here's a 20. Okay, you want more? Here's a 30. You want more? Here's a 40 or 50. You want more? Here's a 60 or 70. And while I'm doing that, I can feel what how they're how they're doing with all that. And if I can tell they're starting to get hurt, but they're asking for more, at some point I go, you're getting hurt right now. You want me to turn this up? I don't want to be responsible for this. So no, I'm not going to do that. 
You know, I've seen him do this to people, literally, literally, where he's had to, he's had to go like, look, time out. Uh, you're, you know, any morning you're going to the hospital, you're almost puking your guts. We had, we had a guy, we had a guy come here, and he's, he is one of our regional organizers. It's, it's uh, Rob from Israel. And when I first started teaching him, he paid for some private lesson time, and literally did some stuff where it was some demot, but through the touch, through the contact, and he had felt it from other masters, and he was like, I want to see if you have that. And so I did it at a level, and he was like, eh, I'm not really feeling that. Can you turn that up? And I said, grades of about 10 to 20%, sure. Here's 10 to 20% more. And did it again. And he was like, oh, I'm not really feeling that yet. Could you, could you up that some more? Sure. And I did this. And about time number four, I realized he's starting to look like not right. Like, he's starting to look bad. He's, he's moving funny. And he's like, could you turn that up more? And I was like, you are not looking so hot. And he's like, I'm okay, I'm okay. And I'm he looks like, sick, like the color drained yeah. out of him. Well, and I did like it up woozy. by the time we got done. That's right. when I, I did it one more time. He starts looking like that, and he's like, more. And I'm like, no, I'm done. And he was like, really, I'm okay. And I'm looking at him going, you don't look okay. And, and he's like, I'm okay. And I was like, all right, great. Okay, so you you felt this before from other teachers. He's like, yeah. And he said, you know, and even more and all that. And so I said, okay, well, so you're really okay. Yep, I'm okay. We look at him. Okay, next appointment for him to come because he was here from Israel was the next day. He leaves. We don't see him for two weeks. We kind of thought that he was unimpressed. I thought he was so unimpressed that he went, screw that, and he left. No, he showed back up, and he says, oh, my God. I was sick like I had a bad flu. I was in bed and couldn't get out for the first two days. And I was like, okay, yeah. Like, should have called. You should, a, you should have called <laughs> so we could come and, and fix you up. And B, I don't care how much you ask because at that time his attitude was, I want to feel it, I want to feel it, I want to feel it. Like, if you hit him, crack, he was like, ow, oh, oh, oh. is that all you got? You know, and then it was like, yeah, well, I broke one of your ribs just now. Yeah, can you do more? <laughs> no, I'm not going to do more. Uh, anyways, and so I just, I, you know, with, and I, I just, you get the idea. I just learned that you got to be cautious because people aren't always smart about this. And so I would rather err on the side of caution most of the time than to give them too much. Um, and so I do that, but unfortunately, it's not always the best thing for me. Because then they go out and go, ah, eh, you know, it's still, I don't know. And that would be better off. They went, oh, man, the dude touched me and, like, one of my ribs broke. But, you know, I don't want to be responsible for that. We have a few less long-term students that way, probably. That too. <laughs> anyways, Rob's diehard fan and all about our stuff. And, he, yes. and you know, and he was – He's funny because he went from, from hit me with that, hit me with that, hit me with that, hit me with that, you know, to once he realized I really, really, really had it. He became, okay, don't touch me with that. <laughs> <laughs> Flip completely the other side of the fence. But, Which is smart. That indicates that he is an intelligent person. But I do want people to know that it's really there. I am willing to do what I can. I'm not willing to put you in the hospital or kill you for you to find out. But I'll grade it up while we and you are both monitoring. And if it's for something where you're starting to look like him, I've had that happen to other people over the years. I try not to let it go that far. And if it does, I try to fix you up. But at the same time, if you're standing there looking all sick now, and you're telling me, I'm great. Okay, but I'm not going to touch you again because for now, you know, let's, you go, you go, tell me how that is in a couple days and then we'll see what's, what's what after that. But anyways, it's, yeah, so. Well, I forget how, quite, quite how we got on, onto that, but the, uh, the, the, the takeaway from the big picture today, um, at, you know, a lot of the things that we talked about uh, involve like higher level Tai Chi, making sure that what we do is Tai Chi, you know, what is the big picture of Tai Chi? Is this a Tai Chi skill or not? And, you know, and how do we as non, you know, masters um, ourselves who, who are, you know, are not there yet, how do we discern that kind of stuff? Um, and so if you're wondering that, if you're interested in this, um, I would say first, check out the Tai Chi Roadmap.com, just, just Tai Chi Roadmap.com. Uh, that gives the training stages for Tai Chi in the big picture. And so if you're not sure- The training stages for Tai Chi, whether you're doing Chin or Yang or Wu or Wu style or, or, um, or, um, or well, or Wudong Mountain style, whatever it is, if it's actually Tai Chi, it follows that order of, of bigger category events for the roadmap. 
Yeah, so if you're wondering, like, is this a Tai Chi skill or is it a real Tai Chi skill? It's if you if you know the roadmap, if you've seen that 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 video, if you understand those those training stages, you'll be able to tell that you know, yes, this is or is not a Tai Chi skill. And if it is, like, where it belongs in the curriculum, like, what level of Tai Chi skill it really is. What really constitutes a master versus a beginner versus a, an intermediate student at different levels and all that stuff. All that stuff. Um, and so I would say go, you know, first check that out, go to tai chi roadmap.com And then right behind that, to actually get on the path to becoming a more skilled Tai Chi person and to actually get these Tai Chi skills for yourself, the entire curriculum from beginning to end is, is laid out in, you know, the training stages in the order that you need to work them in for the most progress, the fastest, and that's available at clearmartialarts.com. So check that out uh, as well. And if you want personal guidance and help, and you've been in Tai Chi for a while, or you're, or it's something you know you seriously want to do, and you'd like to really get some direct guidance for how to train and what to do and how to train it and and that kind of a thing, go to uh, internalpowerrevelation.com. So if you're kind of starting out in Tai Chi. Tai Chi Roadmap, ClearMartialArts.com. If you're an old hand and uh, and you know want to talk about like next steps for you. We've done it for a year or two, and now you're wanting to get into the real body of, of higher level stuff. Yep, and want and, and want to get it quick, and uh, and want to get it you know tailored to you, and that and those kinds of things. Um, go to InternalPowerRevelations.com. Cool. All right. Um, hey guys, thanks for participating. <laughs> What kind of doggy? What's that? She's gonna say Heinz. That's an Australian cattle dog. Oh. Or the Blue Healer. They're called Blue Healer. Yeah. yeah Blue Healer. <laughs> yeah. Cool. She's very affectionate. Oh yeah. The uh, well, thanks, thanks for participating today. More next time. You guys have a great week. Um, I look forward to talking to all of you that I get to between now and then, and. Um, Keep training, stay stay healthy and well, and more next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Sifu. Sifu. Bye. Thank you, Sifu. Bye-bye. And now, a word from our sponsor. Is chi real? The word chi is the Chinese word for energy. And energy is everywhere, all around us. Physics says so. The question is not, does energy exist? Because, of course, energy exists. The real question is, what forms of energy can human beings tap into and use? My name is Richard Clear, and internal power is what I do. After over 40 years of continuous study and research, I created a one-of-a-kind online program that my students are raving about. In it, I revealed the secrets of effortless internal power. The program has had so much success, I decided to take it to the public. In fact, the results are so powerful that I put a money-back guarantee on it. Find out more about this incredible program at internalpowerkeys.com.